My dear friends and budding historians, welcome to today's lecture, which is about China's super long 19th century. So by super long, I'm saying we kind of start the late 1700s and we'll end up in the, the late 1900s. So that's um, 1800s plus. If you are in my global history class this semester, you can follow along with this lecture by looking at the PowerPoint slides because this lecture is basically going to walk you exactly through those slides. So go ahead and grab those PowerPoint slides and we'll talk about the sleeping dragon. This quote is attributed to Napoleon. He said uh, around the year 1803, he said, let China sleep, for when the dragon awakes, she will shake the world. Okay, um, and so hopefully today's lecture will help you understand what he meant when he said China was sleeping. And also toward the end, you'll see, you'll start to see this dragon wake up. It's, and it's pretty, pretty exciting. It's good stuff. So let's overview, just, just to review, by 1800, China was still the biggest and most economically productive country on the planet, biggest in terms of population size, okay? Um, big producers agriculturally, not just rice, but also barley, wheat, and all the litany of, of the other agricultural products. Um, you know, meat and, and vegetables and all that great stuff. Also, artisanal products like beautiful silks, porcelain, things like that. Beautiful um, decorative items that the Europeans in particular were mad for these things. Chinese lacquers, Chinese um, paintings, um, Chinese colossine jewelry, things like that. So it, economically, China is producing and producing, outproducing all of all of the European powers. Now, by the way, remember that China also has the largest population. So if you look at GDP figures from this era, if it's broken down per capita, then China's GDP looks much lower because there's so many people there um, producing all of this stuff. So their per capita production actually is not does not line up with the overall share of their economic production. Mm -hmm. um, so by the way, we, we didn't get to talk about this much before. China's huge. It's also extremely diverse. There are dozens of different ethnic groups, dozens of different languages, languages in different language families. So not only are the languages not necessarily mutually intelligible, but they're wildly different structures. So it's not always so easy to jump from, for example, um, Spanish and Italian are in the same language family. So um, they're different languages, but the structure is the same. So it's kind of like logical when you study it versus some of these languages in China are different language families. So the, the way the language works is so very different and many different religious traditions. There are, are Confucians, there are Buddhists, there are Taoists, there are local kind of animist faith. There is a growing Chinese population. There are many Muslims in China um, back then and to this day. Um, so, so that overview is just to kind of set us up for where we're at in the 19th century. You can think about what we spoke about in our very first lecture together about the Mughal Empire, right? Which was India. This was a huge agrarian empire that was very successful in the 1500s, very successful in the 1600s. Okay, things is changing a little in the 1700s. And then the 1800s, things start to fall apart. Another comparison, um, actually our last lecture together was the Ottoman state. So similar, large kind of land-based, very successful in the earlier time period. And in the 1800s, things start to come undone a little bit. And the reason things start to come undone has a lot to do with the encroachment of imperial powers, usually Western powers. 
um, I'll walk you through a couple a couple of the situations that happen. One of the first um, really serious problems was the opium wars with Great Britain. Great Britain believed that they needed to sell more products in China in order to maintain a kind of economic balance. And as we kind of joked about before, the Chinese weren't interested in what the, the British were selling. Okay, the Chinese were like, that's some cute wool, but we have silk, right? Um, the Chinese were, were not, there weren't a lot of British products out there the Chinese wanted. The East India Company, because of, of their extension into Central Asia, where opium poppies grow, started to get plugged into an illicit trade of opium. Um, so opium is, uh, the, the poppy grows and then you cut the poppy and the poppy heals itself by producing a kind of a white sap, like a white goo. And you scrape that goo off and then you dry it and turn it into a kind of a powder. And the powder opium, um, can, it, was, it was mixed with tobacco back then to be smoked, uh, often in opium dens. And it has um, a couple of properties. One is it, it suppresses um, your appetite. Um, another is, is that it makes you extremely lethargic, so you're just kind of really just sleepy. Um, and finally it gives you a, a euphoric feeling, so you feel in your mind, you're sleepy on the outside, but in your mind you feel like you're feeling really good. So this is a really terrible drug because it, it debilitates the individual, it's highly addictive, um, and it's, it, it's just debilitating. Um, and then the whole, the whole community can fall apart as, as more and more individuals get sucked into this, their family falls apart. Remember the family is the, that's the key um, structure of the community in China. The family falls apart, the community falls apart um, more and more. So the Chinese government says this, this, is, this is enough, this has got to end. These people have got to stop bringing drugs into our country. And they set up laws to say no more, this is illegal. You cannot bring this um, poison and sell it to our children. This, that's it. The British say, we're going to sell it. Uh, we will shoot you if you don't let us sell these drugs. Okay, the British rolled up with their gunboats. They fought a first war from 1839 to 1842, and they won the war. The British gained the port of Hong Kong to be their own colony, and they also gained the, the right to trade in five treaty ports. So these treaty ports allowed them... Sorry about that. Um, coming to you live from, from Madison Avenue. Um, not live, but... Um, the British were allowed to trade whatever they wanted to, including drugs in these treaty ports. Um, and then even a second opium erupts in the following decade. Um, the British went again. Um, there's other skirmishes. There's a war with France. So we have this very unfair and uneven situation where Britain and, and France and the other powers, they don't colonize China. So they don't actually have an, a technical empire there, but what they have is called a soft empire. Where they are able to kind of bust in, call the shots a little bit. Um, within China, there's a lot of rebellions and uprisings that kind of um, meld these exterior issues with also issues that are happening more internally. Even as early as 1795, there was a big uprising, the White Lotus Uprising, which was based on um, a kind of a, a Buddhist ideology, and they were trying to uprise against the, the empire. In 1851, there's the beginning of a very long, actually it's really more of a civil war. It's called the Taiping Rebellion. It goes to about 1865, so this Taiping Rebellion was um, a huge group of followers followed a man named Hong Shiquan. And I apologize, my pronunciation's probably way off there. Um, Hong 
was uh, from the Hakka people, so he was not Han Chinese, so he had a different culture. The Hakka people, um, one thing to know about the Hakka people that's pretty interesting is that um, they did not practice some of the more um, uh, oppressive practices toward women. So the Hakka people would uh, not uh, bind the feet of their women. So, so the women were more able to join in and participate in society in a really active way. Um, people were drawn to Hong. He was very charismatic. He had been reading pamphlets and information from Christian missionaries. He studied with one Christian missionary, and then he had a dream that he was the brother of Jesus Christ and that he would lead the, the people of the area in a new day, in a new dawn. So he, he leads this rebellion. Um, it is eventually crushed by the official government, um, but it goes on for almost 15 years, and at least 20 million people died in this rebellion, maybe more. 20 million. That's a staggering figure. So... Um, and you can see 1851, 1865, so this is right in the middle. There's that second opium war going on. The Chinese are desperately trying to collect enough taxes to pay the indemnities from this series of wars. So there's just so much chaos, so much chaos. There's an attempt to reform and fix these problems. There's continuing attempts to reform, I should say. But um, in, the 18, in 1898, even the emperor of China wants to reform, and he passes some reforms. And within the court, there's all these machinations, and the emperor is placed under house arrest. So you have a, an attempt to reform, and then that's crushed, right? An attempt to rebel, crushed. In 1900 to 1901, another rebellion. This is called, um, in the West, it's called the Boxer Rebellion because it's kind of under the, the aegis of a group called the Society of the Harmonious Fists, um, which is martial artists, right? And they unite, they want to expel the foreign powers and reestablish Chinese autonomy. Now, at first, the boxers are also, they, they don't want the empire there. They, they don't want the emperor there. So they're also against the Chinese government, but they're able to work together um, the Chinese government and the Society of the Harmonious Fists, and they fight against the all of the foreign powers. The foreign powers, the imperial powers, come together to defeat and crush this boxer rebellion. If you have my slides, there's a cartoon there showing even the Americans were involved. They sent over troops to crush this boxer rebellion. And after the rebellion, um, again, a large indemnity is given. Indemnity meaning China has to pay a kind of a, um, like a, a fine, if you will, for the, for the incident to the opposing powers. And the imperialists also win the right to post their own troops in the Chinese city. So you'd have um, maybe American soldiers or, or British soldiers more commonly just marching through um, certain of these treaty towns, which really changes, um, you know, the, the structures of that day-to-day -day power of what's going on. Okay, so let's return to, so, so those were kind of all the rebellions that are really interwoven with imperialism. So just to say a little more on these conflicts with the imperial powers, these imperial powers, um, again, didn't tend to formally take over China as like an annexed colony. Instead, they had these so-called spheres of influence, meaning that they were allowed to, to act within that particular era, um, uh, in that particular region, excuse me, so in, in a certain region was kind of like the Germans' sphere of influence. Another area was more um, kind of given to the French, and then amongst them, the powers would kind of let each other be, right? They each had their own piece. Um, and by the way, Japan begins to get in 
on the act. And we'll, you will understand that more after you look at our slides about the Meiji era of Japan. But Japan, the short version is they were able to very rapidly industrialize and become an imperial power right along with France, Germany, Russia, and, and Britain, and the United States, by the way. Okay, so I want to take um, just maybe two or three minutes to look at the political cartoon um, that's included on your slides. Um, this is a French political cartoon. And if we were meeting together in person, um, we, we would have more of a discussion and I would ask you more about what you see. Um, so instead, I'll just kind of walk through how a historian can approach a visual primary source like this and break it down and analyze it in detail. So you kind of start with just, what do I see? Um, you know, I, I see a panic man in the back. I see a uh, grumpy looking old lady and a super grumpy looking man with a spiky helmet. Next to him, a man with a pointed beard. Uh, there's a kind of a lady with a red hat behind that. This other guy is looking thoughtful. And I'm realizing this guy all the way to the right looks Asian to me. He has his hair pulled back in a bun. So I'm starting to get the sense that this guy is Japanese and I'm starting to put this together now. Okay, all of these people are crowded around a big disc. Actually, it kind of reminds me of a pizza crust. I'm going to think of this as a pizza pie, right? So let's think of this as a pizza pie. And on the pie, it says sheen, okay, which I might look up on Google if I didn't know that that was French for China. And I know this is a French cartoon. So the pie is China. And I'm realizing the man standing up and panicked. I'm thinking now he's Chinese. He has this hat that I've seen in pictures before, his clothing, and the beads, very typical of a Qing uh, administrator. And he has a long braid. I, I know he's a Qing now because he, uh, in the Qing Empire, the, their administrators had something called a Q, which was this long braid. I've seen that in movies before. So um, as a student, I might get that far to see, say, okay, all of these powers are chopping up China and China doesn't like it. And that's a perfect reading. Okay, very good. I'm going to take this a little further and start to look a little more deeply at what else do I see. Let's just take it to that next level. Okay, um, who is sitting around the table? That one guy I'm thinking is Japanese. And I see is a really lovely kind of Japanese style sword at his side. And then I look at the other three people at the table. They all have a knife of some kind. The guy in the middle has his knife like grr, like he's stabbing into the pie. He looks really mean. He's a spiky helmet, typical of, and I know you students would tell me, the Germans, right? So this is, this is probably Kaiser Wilhelm, okay, representing Germany. The lady to the side, the old lady with her tiny little crown, um, we might be able to determine this is Queen Victoria. She also has a really big knife. She's ready to do some chopping, Queen Victoria. And the um, last gentleman who's sitting might not be so obvious to tell, but I would show you a picture of Tsar Nikki uh, in Russia, um, Tsar Nicholas. I say Nikki, we're, we're like that, we're on first name term basis. But so this, this is Tsar Nikki with his um, traditional pointed beard and his little hat here. So now I know this is England, Germany, Russia, and Japan. Um, and I know it's a French cartoon, so it makes sense that the lady at the side, who is this lady? We've seen her before, actually. We've seen a portrait of this lady before. The last time we saw her, she was having a bit of a wardrobe malfunction, you'll remember. Ah, yes. This is Marianne. Marianne is the symbol of France. Um, so I think it's really interesting that we have Britain, Germany, and Russia represented by their specific monarchs, which is Victoria, Kaiser Wilhelm, and Tsar Nicholas. So that's quite specific to these are kings and queens. France is, is represented by Marianne. So I'm guessing this cartoon might be from the Republican period uh, because it's not 
representing um, any emperor. It's representing France when it was a republic. And look at her hat. That's the that's that um, rosette, that um, kind of white circle with the blue inside on the red hat. That's a sign of the French Revolution. So Marianne's here to represent that France is a republic. So now I'm starting to think this cartoon is setting up France as participating in the carving up of the pie, but in a different way. France is looking on. Um, everyone else has either a big old butcher knife or a samurai sword. France is unarmed, right? France is standing behind, looking over. So I could develop my first interpretation. Remember my first interpretation was all of the imperial powers are carving up China, okay? Great, but now I can take it to the next level. However, so now you add a little nuance to it. However, perhaps because it is a French cartoon, a French drawing, France is represented as a, a much less aggressive and a more beneficent, um, uh, that is to say more, a more positive um, imperial presence versus the other imperial powers. Okay, so that was kind of a, a long-winded explanation of what's happening in the cartoon, but I wanted to show you that if you keep looking at something and keep looking at something, you can draw a lot more of that uh, out of it. And you can actually write a four-page paper on something like just one visual source, okay? So something to keep in mind as you're working on your analysis of primary sources. Okay, everyone had wanted, everyone wanted a piece of China. Okay, now you think a culture as old as China with as big a population of China is gonna let it go after the Boxer Rebellion? No, 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 no. They are gonna come out swinging. You know they are. Um, in fact, a revolutionary party forms to overthrow the monarchy because they see the monarchy is not able to get things done. Even if your emperor passes reforms, the, the court is just too old fashioned and too kind of stuck in their own world and they won't move China forward. China needs to move forward. They need to kind of see what Japan did and, and get rid of the old strategy of administration and have a new style of government. Um, the party, um, it starts out with a different name, but it, it evolves later into something called the Chinese Nationalist Party. It's led by a man named Sun Yat-sen, a, a very brilliant thinker. In 1911, they, they have a, finally a successful revolution. Look at this, only 10 years after the Boxer Rebellion. So that's what I mean when I say they're gonna come out swinging. They're not gonna wait. 10 years later, they have a revolution overthrowing the monarchy. Okay, so they don't get involved with fighting the imperial powers. It's kind of like one, let's, one, one fire at a time situation. Let's get rid of this monarchy first. Okay, get our own government together. And they formed the Republic of China in 1912. Um, and this Republican era will last until about 1949. And it sounds like things are going great, but but unfortunately, there's so much turmoil through this um, this overthrow of the monarchy with everything else going on that it, the country is in reality broken up into um, some very different regions where local warlords warlords have the um, where local warlords have the actual power, and it takes a long time to kind of get these. Um, kind of separate areas under control of a central republic. So Sun Yat-sen is, is sort of kind of pushed to the side after about 1916. He's kind of like this, he's, he's a brilliant man, but they kind of need, I don't, I don't want to say need, but a strong man emerges, Chiang Kai-shek. He kind of steps in to become the leader of this Chinese Nationalist Party. He becomes the leader of the Republican government. Okay, and he steps in to kind of slowly bring each of these places under control. While all this chaos is going on, some people become very interested in the ideas of Marx and the ideas of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. 
and a Chinese Communist Party is formed in 1921. And that's a bit of a cliffhanger. We'll talk more about everything that happened with that in a couple weeks. Um, I'll leave you with some films. Um, if you're bored during all of this, this time where you're trying to stay at home, if you're bored, there's, there's some great films about China. I just chose these three because I think they really... Uh, these are, are not historical films. They're, they're not um, documentaries, but they take place in the time period. Some of them are based on some real events. The Last Emperor is based on real events. Um, and they really bring it to life. Uh, my favorite of these, I, I gotta admit, is actually Jet Li's Fearless. So start, start with that one. That one's pretty cool. Thanks so much for joining me today. Be sure to leave your questions and comments. Well, if you're my student, go ahead and email me or contact me on Blackboard. But anyone watching is welcome to put your comments in the comment area below.